This video is brought to you by ASRock and the Z590 Velocitor. This is a Z590 board. It's got some pretty killer features. 10 USB ports at the back. We've got Intel and Killer Nix, as well as the Wi-Fi 6E, which is supported by the Killer Double Shot Pro software, which I recently did a video on. You should check that out. It has Realtek ALC 1220 audio with the Nahemic audio drivers. And the USB Type-C front panel connection is a 20 gigabit connection. This board supports up to DDR4 4800. It's also got some premium features right in the box. <laughs> One of them, an extra VRM fan. I mean, this is a 50 amp VRM solution, which is more than adequate for any kind of ordinary stuff that you're going to be doing with 11th gen Rocket Lake CPUs, PCI Express 4 in the NVMe and the X16 slot. But if you do find a 10th gen Intel CPU on sale or a really good deal, well that'll work just fine on this board too. We actually selected this board to use as our new storage platform test. So we're going to be testing PCIe 3 and PCIe 4 storage on this platform, SSDs like the Intel P5800X. And with all that, this motherboard comes with a uh, GPU holder bracket. Good job ASRock and thanks for sponsoring this video. All right, we're here to talk about something very special, the Intel P5800X, one of the most confounding pieces of technology ever that I spent my own money on, at least this particular one. Although I am working on Intel to give me a second one because I have some ideas to do some really cool stuff, but I'm gonna need more than one of these and uh, they're expensive, but they're good. I mean, Intel knows what they have. This is a technology like, the gods of old descended from Mount Olympus and Hephaestus forged this with their, you know, awesome forgery skills. I mean that in the best possible way. And Zeus used his lightning skills from, from on high to zap the lightning into the rock. And thus was born Optane, which is an entirely different storage medium than NAND Flash. It is insanely exciting. You know, there was, this is not the first one. There's prior generation, there was this weird Star Citizen marketing campaign where I think there's, I wonder if the Star Citizen credits in here are still good. And then, you know, like the Enterprise grade P4800X. So this was for the Enterprise, you didn't get Star Citizen. This was for the Enthusiast, which is basically the same thing, just packaged up a little different and a little cheaper than the Enterprise drive. As yet, there is no Enthusiast equivalent of this. And yet, it's PCI Express 4 and insanely fast. <laughs> Let's do a deep dive. Look, I always say I'm a big fan of Optane. You just had no idea how much of a fan of Optane that I really was. This is the 800 gigabyte model. It's the one that I picked up. The 400 gig is just a little too small and the 1.6 terabyte was just a little too unaffordable at three and a half thousand dollars over a thousand dollars a terabyte when NAND flash storage, even the good stuff you know, from Samsung, like the high-end stuff with their custom controller, because Samsung's always got the spicy, you know, custom engineering. Yeah, it's on the order of like $150 a terabyte, not $1,500 a terabyte. It's 10 times more. So yeah, I'd say Intel knows what they have here. This is really, really good stuff. You see these used in the enterprise to do things like database write caching and online application processing, transaction logs for database servers, things like that. And the reason for that is these are so fast, you can do quality of service engineering on them to be sure that read write operations are basically guaranteed in a short order. You can also use an array of them to make even more specific guarantees about workloads and uh, time delta and things like that. The reality is that this is 3D X point. This is not NAND, so it's a different technology. And this is a PCI Express 4 device that saturates the PCI Express 4x4, four four. it's a four lane interface, at up to eight gigabytes per second. Intel actually rates these for like seven and a half gigabytes per second, but in my testing, I can peak in a, in a perfectly, perfectly ideal scenario. I can get this thing up to two and a half million IOPS. One device, two and a half million IOPS, that is insane. Uh, Intel rates it for about one and a half million IOPS in a purely 4K, you know, random read scenario. And if you get a 70-30 mixed read-write, they rate it for two million IOPS. You can really cherry pick stuff and get two and a half million IOPS. So kudos for Intel for not going with the two and a half million number. But to give you an idea, so a lot of the testing I had initially done on Threader for Pro, it takes about four and a half cores on Threadripper Pro for truly random IO to saturate this because four Threadripper cores can't keep up with the random IO on this thing. Now to be sure, one core 
can saturate this thing with the sequential. One core can handle a sequential seven and a half gigabyte per second transfer. But when we're talking about random IOs and servicing two million operations per second on something that's only running at three or four billion operations per second, we have, you know, low five figures worth of CPU instructions per core to deal with that. So we're gonna need more cores to share the load because of the sheer number of CPU instructions necessary to handle that workload. So I've done the full benchmarking on this. Um, the crystal disk mark numbers, the latency numbers, the number of IOPS, things that you can expect on a desktop performance. The benchmark numbers don't really tell you the whole story. The latency, it's like with NAND flash, uh, the latency when you go to look up something is usually on the order of 100 to 150 microseconds. Worst case scenario on this is like 60 microseconds. It's best case scenario is about six microseconds. So it's about on average, about halfway between the latency of main memory and NAND flash. Of course, main memory is, you know, ephemeral, you lose power. What was in main memory is lost. That's why you see Optane in a dim format and they finally have a controller and matrix and all of that stuff that can actually keep up. It's been a while, you know, Intel was a little late to the game with PCI Express 4 for these, I was a little surprised, but this is, <laughs> each device can saturate PCI Express 4, which is nuts. Completely nuts. And I've got Ice Lake in the house to do testing on the Ice Lake side of things. So in fact, doing the testing here has broken my bench for doing SSD testing. So I'm actually switching to Rocket Lake to do IO testing because it requires less cores to fully saturate the interface on something like this. And this is the absolute high end of, of what you can expect. So, Software-wise, how can you make this go fast? That's where this story kind of falls apart. Intel expects you to use this as the whole drive or for your application to know what Optane is and to be able to deal with it. So for something like Microsoft SQL Server or PostgreSQL, you can store the uh, replay logs on this, you can store transaction logs on this, and the database server intrinsically knows how to deal with that. It knows how to deal with a different block device for those kinds of storage. It's not built for Optane specifically, uh, but it knows how to deal with a block device and the separation of things on the block device, and so that works really well. Uh, things like VMware, if you're running an all flash setup with VMware, VMware knows specifically how to deal with Optane. If you're running vSAN, um, then your, and your capacity tier is also flash, then it will use something like the Optane cache, if you're using an Optane de device as your cache tier, It'll use it for write caching, basically. And these are exceptionally good at that. The endurance in this, 100 drive writes per day. So 800 gigabytes. I can write five times 800 gigabytes to this drive per day for five years, and it's still under warranty. These things are basically indestructible. This is the one storage meeting where the price has actually gone up over time. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but like even our, our plucky old P4800X SSD has basically held its value really well. And they're still kind of pricey on eBay, even though these don't saturate the PCI Express 3.0 interface. The gauntlets have come off, as I say, and the gods have descended from Mount Olympus and brought us the P5800X, it's that good. And yes, you absolutely, absolutely can use this as your primary storage drive. But here's why that's dumb. Windows is huge. It's like 40 gigabytes by the time you get the Windows side-by-side -side stuff and all that kind of stuff. But the pathway that your specific workflow uses in all of that code to boot up the machine is only on the order of like five, six gigabytes, eight gigabytes at most. So you really want something sitting between your operating system and your storage medium that's going to move all of the crap that you're not actually using, that you're not actually depending on for speed off of this onto something more affordable like NAND flash. And there's not really, okay, well, there are enterprise products that deal with that, but they are wildly expensive. Um, like the Inmodus Enterprise software, it's very, very good about dealing with this and it's available on like Linux and stuff like that. That's an option for pedestrians, you know, pleb tier. I just want my Windows 10 workstation to run fast and I'm not willing to run virtual machines. Primo Cache, Primo Cache is pretty much it. Beyond the benchmarks, what you would see with this drive is really kind of nuts. And we need to cut to huh, uh, desk benchmark window for me to show you. So when we were talking about H20 on the laptop, you know, H20 is a, a combination of Optane and flash device where Intel's doing that, but Intel's doing the software part of it with RST. I really like that product. It's really good. Only applicable on Intel platforms. Primo Cache is applicable pretty much everywhere. And when you use this drive on 
say an AMD platform, it will work fine. It just shows up as a U.2 device. So if you're doing the database workload or you're doing anything like that, works fine. If you're using Primo Cache, something like that, works totally fine. If you wanna use this on an Intel platform with Intel RST, guess what? Nope. They're not gonna to touch that with a 10 foot pole. It's not been qualified, it's not been tested. They do not want it to work. You should, you're using it wrong. You're using it wrong. But I showed you on a laptop how you could launch a bunch of programs simultaneously. So if you are crazy enough to use this just as your boot drive, uh, you can, and it's fine on Team Red or Team Blue, or even on ARM for that matter. Uh, and it will be insanely fast. And the technical reason for that is a large, large part of the technical reason for that is that most of the user interactive applications, stuff that you experience, that's, that's at low Q depths. You know, the computer's only getting one to four things at a time from storage. And this storage is exceptionally good at that. But unlike old Optane, it's also exceptionally good at streaming as well. So things like loading a level. So if you bought this for Star Citizen, Star Citizen is going to be as bananas going from this to this as it was when you went to this from a NAND SSD. It's that insane. And the numbers are on the level one form if you wanna check that out. Uh, the drive doesn't slow down as it's loaded. So like with the Samsung 980 Pro, it starts out at 1.1 million IOPS. It will get a little bit slower as it fills. You can see that in the FIO benchmarks. If you're running something like, like the Mushkin uh, Gamma, their new SSD with the new Fison E18 controller, which is really, really an incredible piece of engineering from Fison. They've done a great job with that. Still, the fundamental limitation is NAND flash. NAND flash is not gonna take care of you in terms of uh, those kinds of low latency things. You can, there's RAM on the card and some things can be cached and there's a lot of software optimization you can do. But at the end of the day, it's just not as fast. So you're, you're kind of limited in what you can do. That drive starts out at 1.7 million IOPS. Oh, well that's within striking distance of Optane, right? No, you still have the really high latency. So you're gonna be waiting a long time, relatively, on those Q-depth one to four things to come back. And that's what makes that interactive experience so good. This is our new benchmark machine. It's based around Rocket Lake, the 11600K. Why Rocket Lake? Well, it's got PCI Express 4, but I encountered some anomalies when I was testing on the 5950X platform. I mean, that's a 16 core platform versus a six core. What's going on? Uh, it's interesting enough that I'm gonna do a separate video on it, but um, the amount of IOs that you can do while only using one CPU core was quite a bit higher on Rocket Lake than it was on the 5950X. Now for real world benchmarking, loading games, stuff like that, wasn't really much of a difference that I could tell between the two platforms when you're sort of IO constrained. I mean, even using a P5800X as like your Steam drive, it didn't really seem to make a lot of difference. So our uh, Rocket Lake PCI Express 4 SSD test platform is based around the ASRock uh, Velocita Z590, and I'm running uh, Linux off of a SATA SSD. We also have Windows that's running off of a SATA SSD so that we can just throw in a PCI Express 3 or 4 NVMe or U.2 in this case, because I've got the U.2 carrier card for the P5800X, and it is running at PCI Express 4 speeds so that we can do the full Monty of benchmarks. Now, Intel rates this drive at 1.5 to 2 million IOPS, depending on what you're doing. But if you're using ridiculously small 512 byte sectors and you, you create some other not exactly realistic real world testing scenarios, uh, artificial benchmarks, let's say, you know, four or five million IOPS is possible. And you're talking about three million, like upwards of two, three million IOPS being possible per core on Rocket Lake, running at about five gigahertz. So that's pretty interesting. This is a pretty interesting test platform. We're gonna do a separate video on that, but boy howdy, that is fast. That's just another data point that says the P5800X is in a class by itself. It's literally from another planet in terms of being in a class by itself. We had to set up a whole new test bench. If you wanna take a look at the FIO scripts and other stuff that we're contemplating for a standardized 2021 SSD test bench, I've got a thread up on the level one forums. Definitely come and contribute. I've got FIO files for read, mixed read, write, and write workloads that I wanna kinda of have a standardized setup. Just to give you an idea of how insane the P5800X is, here is a side-by-side -side with a four NVMe array of the Samsung 983s. These are also enterprise grade SSDs. This is eight terabytes 
of flash in this array and look at these performance numbers. Yeah, the streaming score is a little better than a single P5800X, but otherwise the P5800X completely demolishes that array. It's really, truly breathtaking performance. All right, so with all the gushing out of the way, what are the bad things? Well, the price, as I've said about five times now, but also these are only available up to 1.6 terabyte capacities. So in an age where I can get this same form factor, well, actually it's a little bit more bulbous. It's like this. Uh, 16 terabytes, 16 terabytes readily available, 45 terabytes available on special order. 1.6 terabytes, kind of paltry. But like I say, for your particular workload, you really don't need a lot, but you do need software that will look through all of the stuff that you're actually using and make sure that everything on here is stuff that you're actually gonna need. Those Windows help files that you never load, if you use this as a boot drive, it is an absolute waste because all those help files you're never gonna look at are at the ready, but you're never gonna load them. So they never needed to be fast in the first place. You need software like Primo Cache to deal with that or some kind of enterprise caching software. And for the enterprise, it's basically there for SQL Server, it's basically there. A Linux, you know, you can even do this with LVM Block Cache. This drops right in for LVM Block Cache. It's really great. A lot of people are using Optane for their ZFS intent log because the right endurance is so good. Those are options. But even at 1.6 terabyte capacities, it's a little on the small side if you're gonna use it for things like your ZFS metadata special device. You're back into, you probably need to use the 16 terabyte NAND flash for that if you have particularly large pools because you'd be surprised how quickly you can go through 1.6 terabytes for the uh, special metadata devices. I mean, just, you know, 250, 300 terabytes of storage and you're, you're entering that one-ish terabyte of uh, uh, storage for metadata. For most volumes that would store, uh, it depends on the files that you're storing and a whole bunch of other parameters. I don't wanna make blanket uh, descriptions, but generally, that's how I'd size it. So, yeah, will we see 10 terabyte Optane? No, not as long as the, the price is this high. Not even Facebook and Google can afford it. But it really is, basically alien technology deposited in our hands. It really is that good. Don't take my word for it. You know, check out other reviews, check out other stuff. But for that use case, it's really, it's really incredible. If you have anything that you think that would work well for testing this, reach out. Let's run some tests because I've got this in test machines. I've also got many of the older ones, not just the, the 900 series, but also a bunch of these 375 gig P4800Xs. So we can do some fun stuff. Let's get to it. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and you can find me being really excited about the P5800X and Optane. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.